stand with us. Let's praise the Lord together. seated. Good morning, church. How are you doing today? We were, we were just up here talking about how nice and warm this baptistry water feels today. Uh, I, I've never preached a whole sermon from the baptistry, but I'm considering it this morning. Man, I tell you, we are, we are blessed as a church that uh, very seldom does a week go by that we don't see folks publicly professing Christ through the obedient act of baptism. Uh, we always want to make sure that you know there's not a thing about this water, there's not a thing about this act that forgives one single sin. Forgiveness comes through the grace of God, 
when by faith and trust you receive Jesus as your Lord. This, though, is a beautiful picture of obedience. I tell folks it's kind of like when you pray to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, that he cleanses you of all sin, because any sin would separate you from him. So all sin, he comes in almost like you got a little bar of soap on the inside of your heart. I'm going to cleanse that entire heart. And so this is a beautiful picture of what God does through salvation. We got seven individuals that'll be getting baptized this morning. And um, yeah, we thank the Lord for that. Hey, we're all so excited uh, that one of our churches that we are planting, the Way Church, out in Panama City Beach this morning, they're meeting at Surfside Elementary. It's where they've been meeting for several months. And today is their baptism, the first baptism, uh, two men, and they're baptizing them in a horse trough this morning, right there in the cafeteria at the Way Church. And so today we rejoice with these in their public profession of faith, their obedience to the Lord. And uh, we would encourage you to examine your own heart and your own life. Where are you with Jesus? And at the end of the service, you'll have the opportunity to profess Him as your Lord and Savior. This is Miss Betty. Last Sunday, 91 years old, and that last Sunday, came forward and said, you know what? I have never publicly professed and followed through in believer's baptism, Jesus as my Savior. And I want to get that right and do that. And so what a great, great picture of obedience to that. And I don't know who this guy is. He just wandered in the pool this morning. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, this is our minister to students, Robbie, and he's up here helping me with Miss Betty in her baptism today. So, Miss Betty, with that being said, today it is my honor, it is my privilege to baptize you. It's also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Jesus. Amen. Amen. Based upon that pr public profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I can baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. What a great job. I don't get to do this a lot. I'm so busy. Our other guys do it. And I said, nope, I'm doing it today. We've got a precious family, sister, brother, mom, dad. This is Miss Willow. Does it feel good or is it cold? Feels good. All right. Willow, today it is my amazing privilege and honor to be able to baptize you. But it's also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you as my sister. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right. This is Mom. Mom, come in here. So, so Mom and Dad today, they've been followers of Christ but they've never followed through in believer's baptism. And when they started working through this, Willow, their daughter, and their son, who will come a little bit later, said, hey, we want to trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so they, after talking with mom and dad, after talking with Tammy, our director of children's ministry, today we're baptizing the whole family. And so we rejoice in that. This is Miss Candace. Candace, today it is my honor, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you, but it's also my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I can baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit.
Mrs. Owen. Pretty neat to see mom and sister get baptized, isn't it, Owen? Owen, today it is my honor and privilege to be able to baptize you. It's also my responsibility to ask you the question, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, I can baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Last but not least, old dad. <laughs> oh, man. Stephen, Stephen, we rejoice with you today. Not often you can say that everybody in the family got baptized today. But uh, what a great and good God we serve. Today it is my privilege, it's my honor to be able to baptize you, but also it's my responsibility to ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you as my brother. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Josh, and Josh and his, his daughter are about to get baptized together in just a second. She'll be down here. Josh, I know that you've shared your testimony. You've shared as you followed Christ as Lord and Savior. And today you understand that what's happening here doesn't forgive you of your sin. It happened the day that you called upon Jesus as your Lord and Savior. And so today it is my honor, it's my privilege to be able to baptize you. But it's also my responsibility to ask you the question, who is the Lord of your life? Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you today as my brother. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So this is Lexus. They call you Lex, Alex. Yeah, what a, last Sunday when we gave the public invitation, uh, Lexus, it was like you were just shot out of a cannon. And uh, prayed to receive Christ as Lord and Savior last Sunday. And so, man, it's my honor and privilege to be able to baptize you, but just like the rest, it is my responsibility to ask you, who is your Lord and Savior? Amen. Lexus, based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you today as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. All right, man. We praise the Lord for that. Hey, guys, you do realize that... Uh, what we have witnessed today, unfortunately, there are a lot of churches that don't see that in over a year's time. And so may we never take for granted the fruit of the gospel that he lets us see every single week around here. It also should motivate us because every single one of us has somebody in our life that needs to be set free through the gospel of Jesus. So let us be quick to tell. You know, we are blessed as a church uh, through your faithful giving, through your faithful service. Kind of the DNA that we build things off of here at Highland Park is we're going to earn the right to be heard. And that means this, we're following the model of Jesus. Jesus would always meet physical needs so that in turn he might meet the greater, which is a spiritual need. I'm thankful that it wasn't a situation where if someone was hungry, Jesus didn't say, Oh, don't worry about that stomach. Don't worry about the fact that you're hungry. No, he would meet the physical need, and then he would say, Now, let me tell you about that greater need. It's spiritual, and you need me as your Lord. 
And so as we build off of that, what we do as a church is we go around and we just love on people in our community. We look for opportunities to share the love of Christ. We do bridge things that I say all the time are bridges so that in turn they might hear the gospel of Jesus. And God has blessed that and he continues to bless that. One such event that we do every year is the Night to Shine. This is through the Tim Tebow Foundation. And uh, we are fortunate, it's kind of a badge of honor that we have, that we are the local Bay County area. Night to Shine Church this past Friday night was Night to Shine. And uh, basically, it's a prom for special needs individuals. And they are called our honored guests. And so not only do we love on them, but we love on their families. And when I say the word prom, it's flat out a prom. And uh, out there in the mall way, man, there's a dance floor. And listen, they're not dancing to uh, Gold City or, you know, the, the Dixie Echo Boys. Uh, they're dancing to Vanilla Ice and, uh, quite honestly, uh, other people that I don't even know who it is. Uh, I just trust our tech guys that it's appropriate music. And, um, and then there's a time where the leadership and I, say let us tell you why we do this because we want you to know that life all life is valuable to us because all life is valuable to God that you are created perfectly and that even though we're all different and unique we're beautiful in his eyes and then we get to share with them we share with their families the love of Jesus Christ and the desire that he has to be your Lord and Savior. If you're one of those families and you're visiting with us today, we're thankful that, man, we've got, we've got some special needs life groups that just some folks in our church that are gifted by God and just a special calling in their life. They lead that every Sunday. And uh, if you're from one of those families, you are welcome here. You're always welcome here. And we pray that you would come and join us. Be a part of our church family. Uh, we would love to have you be a part of this fellowship. But we have a little video today. Uh, just some highlights of Friday night in case you didn't miss it. I wanted all our deacons to see this before our deacons meeting this afternoon. So they would have all the evidence they needed to vote me out. Uh, go ahead and show our video today of Night to Shine. Staring into your eyes makes my heart come alive. Suddenly brought to life when I met you. Reaching me on the skies, running deep, stretching wide. Perfect love realized here with you. Now this love is for real. Hey, we don't, why don't we give God praise for what he has done? I don't tell you this enough. I am proud to be your pastor. Proud for folks to know where I get to uh, serve. And um, you guys truly get what it means to be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. And it's because of your willingness to use those hands and feet. And because of your willingness to give, I mean, my goodness, it takes financial resources to do things like this, to help plant churches that are baptizing people. It's because of your faithful giving that we have the resources to be able to do that. God's just good to us, guys. He is really, really good. 
I'm going to ask our ushers to go ahead and make their way forward. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to be able to tell you about our church a little bit more. We'd love to answer any questions you may have. If you'd take the time to fill out one of our guest registration cards, one of two ways that you can do that. First of all, you can do it electronically on your phone. The very last slide that will be on the screens this morning as the service ends, it'll have a, a number on it where you can take out your phone and you can text the word guest to the phone number on the screen as well as other spiritual decisions. It goes directly to our staff. Or if you want to, you can go ahead all across this room and chair back pockets or cards, physical cards. You can take that card, you can fill it out, you can drop it in this offering bucket. Or what we would encourage, whether you fill out the physical card or you do it electronically, for you to come by the Welcome Center after this service. You won't miss it right out there in the main lobby area. There'll be folks out there, and they'd love to be able to give you some information that you can take home, pray with you, be able to answer any questions that you have face-to-face, -face, and also would love to be able to share with you more about Jesus Christ. We have a free gift that we would like to give you, a sweet little treat. And if you normally attend here at Highland Park, you're a member of our church, you brought somebody with you today. If you'll make sure they come by the Welcome Center, not only do we have a gift for them, we've got a little something special for you because you've been a bringer today. If you're like, well, I met somebody earlier and I didn't bring them, but I don't think anybody else brought them. Well, you're going to bring them now. You bring them by, okay? I got to be honest with you, when I was here Friday night and all of a sudden at the end when the balloons fell and the sparklers started flying, I thought, Lord, 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 we've only built this room twice. Please, Lord. But then they, our team said, those are cool sparklers. I don't really know what that means, to be honest with you. But uh, my prayer was this. Lord, if it catches on fire, let us all get out safe and let it burn all the way to the ground. Because <laughs> we don't want to do that partial rebuild ever again. Okay? Let me lead us in a word of prayer. And after I pray, our ushers are going to be coming. And we worship him through the giving of our tithes and offerings today. Father God, thank you so much. Again, we give testimony to who you are. For without you, we would have no message to give. Without you, there would be no hope. Thank you, Jesus, that when you give us the chance to love on the world, we know what we're going to tell them. Thank you for your gospel that never fails. Thank you, Lord, for what we've already witnessed today. These seven folks publicly professing you as their Lord and Savior. And God, we admit if we just prayed right now and went home, we'd say it's been good to be in the house of the Lord. But thank you, God, you've got more in store. We humble ourselves before you. God, may you take this service and accomplish your perfect plan because it's greater than any we can ever imagine. We love you and we thank you for loving us. Our prayer is that your spirit would guide throughout it all. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray today.
sing with us as Jen leads us. with you. 
Jesus, this morning, Lord, we praise you. Lord, thank you for the gift of salvation. Lord, only through your blood, only through your death on the cross. Lord, thank you. Thank you, Lord, that you love us so very much. Lord, thank you also for this time that we have. Lord, just open your word. Lord, we pray that you would just open our minds and our hearts to what you have for us. Lord, we give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. It's in the precious, powerful, mighty, amazing name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, when I, uh, when I came out and slid next to Jennifer, she said, you're not going to have any time to preach. And, uh, and, I, and I didn't even respond uh, because, yes, I do. <laughs> Here's the good thing. You're the last service, so I don't have to worry about getting you guys out. And the reality is we don't lock the door where you've got to stay in. Now, I'll just say this, though. Let me say this. Because I have folks that come to me from time to time. Hang with us to the invitation and then don't go anywhere. There are Sundays that I'm like, my goodness, we've got 100 people responding to the invitation. And they're coming down from all around stadium seating. And they make the turn and they go out the tunnels. Headed to their cars. We know who you are. We have a letter coming your what? No, I'm just kidding. But please do, stick with us, all right? If you have a Bible day, open that Bible up to the book of John, chapter 1. And if you don't have a Bible, don't worry, the Scripture will be on the screens. And if you don't own a Bible, please stop by the Welcome Center right out there in the main lobby area. And there are Bibles that we would be happy to give you. And you can have your own copy of God's Word. Now... Tuesday is Valentine's Day. Go ahead and write that down, guys. I, I would encourage you to make it Monday so you don't forget. But I heard about this couple that had been married for a long, long time, Frank and Ethel. Frank was sitting at the table one morning, and Ethel was cooking breakfast, and all of a sudden he just screamed, Oh, watch out, watch out! And she jumped back and looked at him, and she's like, What, what, what in the world, what's going on? And he's like, be careful, be careful. The eye of that stove is really hot. And she just kind of rolled her eyes and went back and continued to, to scramble the eggs. And then all of a sudden he's like, whoa, 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 be careful, be careful. You're going to cause the eggs to stick to the pan. Don't let them stick to the pan. This time she didn't even say anything. She just looked over at him. And, and then all of a sudden a little bit later he's like, Salt the eggs, don't forget, salt the eggs, salt the eggs. And she said, all right, all right, that's it. She pointed the, uh, the uh, spatula at him, and she said, what in the world are you doing? He said, well, I just wanted you to know what it feels like when I drive and you're in the passenger seat. <laughs> oh, Frank's a lot braver than I am, I can tell you that. It's kind of like the man who was talking about how he and his wife had just taken a 12-hour trip in the car. And his friend said, did you drive the whole way? He said, no, no, no. My wife did the driving. I just held the steering wheel. <laughs> Let me encourage you guys, not only don't you do that on Valentine's Day, but don't say anything stupid like that any time. Somebody asked me this morning, though, they said, with Valentine's Day being in a few days, do you plan to do a sermon today on love? And here's what I said, absolutely. Every time we gather together, I bring a sermon on love. Because the very book that we use, the Bible, is the greatest love letter the world has ever received. And so as we've been walking through God's Word, specifically the Gospel of John now, for four weeks, in a series entitled, Life in His Name, what we've discovered is that even though you may have bios, even though you may have life physically, that doesn't mean that you have life eternally or life abundantly. We would even say it this way, real life is only found in Jesus. And that while your heart may be beating and your lungs may be working and you're like, I'm able to move my hands and my feet and all that kind of stuff, Understand, God wants you to have life more than just that physical life. One of the things that John's been doing through the first chapter is he's been reminding us just who Jesus is. He's going to go ahead and continue that today. 
Because Jesus, he actually declared three different attributes of God when he came to earth. We're going to look at these three declarations this morning. Look there with me, John chapter 1. Our text will be verses 14 through 18. Verse 14, and the Word became flesh. Now remember, who's the Word? It's Jesus. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of Him and cried out, saying, This was He of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for He was before me. And all of His fullness we have all received and grace for grace maybe you have a translation that says grace upon grace i love that verse 17 for the law was given through moses but grace and truth came through jesus christ no one has seen god at any time but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father he has declared him so three very distinct declarations that we read in this passage of Scripture about God through Jesus. The first one, Jesus declares God's glory. You can look back in verse 14 and you can see where he says it there. He says, we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father. Now, our English word for glory, it means high renown, or it means honor. We use the phrase fame and glory. A lot of times we'll use that when we're talking about uh, world celebrities. We'll use that fame and glory when we're talking about sports heroes. Used to, we would use that when we were talking about politicians. Fame and glory. They're famous and they have glory. But in the Bible, the word glory means a brilliant, shining light. It's the very term that the Jewish rabbis would use when they were describing the very presence of God. They would say the very Shekinah glory of God. Matter of fact, you can go back to the Old Testament book of Exodus. And in Exodus verse, or chapter 35, it tells us the story there of a guy by the name of Moses and Aaron. And so they've been tasked by God with the responsibility as the Israelites are leaving Egyptian slavery, they're making their way to the promised land, and they're going all throughout the wilderness. These two guys, Moses and Aaron, are told by God, I want you to build a tabernacle. I want you to build a place where my presence can dwell, a place of worship. And so they did, they built it. It was a portable tent. Because they would have to set it up and take it down. They would move, they would set it up, they would take it down. It was called the tent of meeting. But again, it represented the very presence of God. And so the glory of God shone them that place to show them that indeed his presence was there. It was dwelling in a special area called the Holy of Holies. What would happen is whenever they would offer a sacrifice, the glory of God would flash down until it was so bright the people could not even look in the direction that the glory of God's, His presence was. Matter of fact, let me read some scripture to you. This is in Leviticus chapter 9. I want you to hear what the Bible says in Leviticus 9, verses 23 and 24. Anybody ever done a Bible study on Leviticus and you've read every single verse of scripture through the book of Leviticus? Anybody? That's kind of what I thought. Anybody's life burst, you're like, mine's in Leviticus. Okay. Not a lot of t-shirts that have Leviticus quotes, probably no coffee mugs either. Listen to what it says. Verse 23. Moses and Aaron then entered the tent of meeting. There it is. When they came out, they blessed the people. The glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. Check this out. Fire came from the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat portions on the altar, and all the people saw it, they shouted, and they fell face down. When Jesus came into the world, guys, he came bearing that divine Shekinah glory of God. On the night that Jesus was born, it says that there were shepherds that were out working in the fields. And the Bible says that the glory of the Lord shone all about them. 
Whenever Jesus would minister, he was revealing that same glory, the Shekinah glory of God. Listen to what Hebrews says about this. This is in the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3. It says, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. In fact, guys, every time that Jesus performed a miracle, and we read a lot about them, that's what happened. His divine Shekinah glory flashed out in that instant. I love the story. Told over in the book of Luke chapter 8, there's a huge crowd that is mobbing around Jesus. And there's a woman that is there, and the Bible says that she's been dealing with this hemorrhaging. She's been dealing with a blood disorder for like 12 years and she's like I've got enough faith if I could just touch Jesus I think I could be healed I I think he has the power to heal me and so she sneaks up behind Jesus she reaches out she grabs his coat and then all of a sudden Jesus is like all right who touched me and the disciples like they're, they're like are you kidding us there are hundreds of people around you Everybody is touching you. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. There's somebody that has touched me. It's a touch of faith. And, and, the, and the, the, the Shekinah glory of God has come out of me. There's a tiny spark of energy. And usually the flesh of Jesus veiled this Shekinah glory. But church, there were special occasions when this brilliant light would flash out from the veil of his flesh. And at that moment, at that moment, Who touched me as his glory went out? See, here's what I believe. I believe at the point of every miracle that Jesus performed, he just allowed that supernatural Shekinah glory of God to flash out. So so what really happened when the baby Jesus was born in Bethlehem? What do we call that? We call that the incarnation. What is that? That's when God took on human flesh. That's what it is. That's what happened. But have you ever wondered this? Why did that happen? Why did God leave heaven? And why did God put on human flesh? Do you know why? So that he could die for you and I. So he could pay the price for our sins. That God needed a human body. Oh, friend, don't miss this. The Son of God became the Son of Man so the children of Adam could become the children of God. Somebody needs to put that on a t-shirt. I don't know. The Son of God became the Son of Man so the children of Adam could become the children of God. C.S. Lewis, one of the most brilliant minds the world has ever known. I want you to hear what he said about this. He said, Jesus Christ, by becoming a man, limited the thing that to him was the most precious thing in the universe his unhampered unhindered communion with the father so that at bethlehem at the incarnation god took on human flesh so that he could live among us and he could walk among us and he could die for our sins Remember what I told you, here's John, and it's like the entire first chapter, John saying, I want you to know who I'm writing about. I want you to know who's changed everything. I want you to know the difference maker. The, 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 the guy that I'm talking about is more than just some average old guy. He's unlike anyone who has ever put on flesh. I want you to know that I'm talking about God in the flesh. And so what did he do? He revealed to us God's glory, but then there's... There's a second declaration that he mentions here. Not only God's glory, but he declares God's grace. Look in verse 14. Jesus declares God's grace. In verse 14, it says again, full of grace and truth. Verse 16, and of his fullness we have all received and grace for grace, right? Grace upon grace. Verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now, this is interesting. I've really never researched this before until today's message. The word grace appears over 200 times in the New Testament. 
Do you know how many times the word grace appears in the four different gospel accounts? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Five times. Five times. Matthew, Mark, Luke, it doesn't even appear in Matthew and Mark. It appears one time over in Luke chapter 2 when he's sitting there and he's saying, uh, talking about Jesus, the child, that he grew in grace and wisdom. And do you want to know the four other times? Right here in our text. Right here where he is saying that Jesus was full of grace and truth. He says that we have received grace for grace. That the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. And so as I'm looking at this, I'm like, why does it appear so few times in the four gospel accounts? It makes no sense. It ought to appear more than anywhere else in the Bible. But yet, if you include what happens over in the book of Luke, it appears five times. The answer is simple. Why didn't Jesus teach about grace? Why didn't Jesus preach about grace? Because Jesus was grace in the flesh. Jesus was the actual embodiment of God's grace. Now there is somebody that talked a lot about grace, and that is Paul. And the reason why is Paul's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe what God has done in my life. I know who I used to be. I know all the terrible things that I've done. I still can't get over grace. Can I tell you, that'd be a great prayer for every follower of Jesus Christ to pray every single day. Oh God, please help me never to get over your grace. I want you to hear what he wrote to a guy by the name of Titus. Over in Titus 2.11, he described the ministry of Jesus in these terms. Listen to what it says. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared unto all people. The grace of God. You see, guys, listen to me. God gives me what I need instead of what I deserve. Because I'm a sinner, I deserve death. Because I'm a sinner, I deserve hell. Because I'm a sinner, I deserve to be separated from God forever and ever. Yet instead of what I deserve, instead of what I've earned, God offers me forgiveness and God offers me eternal life. Now don't miss this. Grace and mercy are not at odds. Grace and mercy are just opposite sides of the very same coin. Mercy is this. Mercy is God withholding the punishment that I do deserve. And grace is God giving me what I need instead of what I've earned. Now think about that. Guys, if you slept in a bed last night with four walls and a roof over your head, if you had the ability to eat three meals yesterday, Okay, listen to me. If you this morning, if you were woke up in a home with running water and electricity, you are better off than 90% of the world's population. If you're able to worship God freely without any fear of persecution or arrest, like is what is happening with millions and millions of Christians around the world this morning, you're doing better than you deserve. Matter of fact, to drive home the point, here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to your neighbor this morning. First of all, wake them up. Or tell them, turn your phone off and put it down. I know you're not reading the Bible. We got some teenagers right now. You're looking at everything on your phone except God's Word, and you need to turn it off because what's coming from God's Word is going to change your life, and what's coming from that phone is going to cloud everything else. And some mamas and daddies as well. Turn to your neighbor this morning, and here's what I want you to say to them. God's giving me more than what I deserve. If you're like, that's too long, say it this way. Say it this way. I'm doing better than I deserve. How about that? I'm doing better than I deserve. Listen to what Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8 says, and it's going to sound familiar to some of you guys, but here's what it says. For you are saved by grace 
through faith. It is not of yourselves. It is God's gift. Here's what it means that there's not anything that you can do to earn a gift. If I were to come to you today and I were to say, you know what, I'm giving you a gift because you mowed my yard. I'm giving you a gift because you washed my truck. I'm giving you a gift. No, 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 no. We're not talking about a gift. Now we're talking about payment. You are receiving because of action. That is not grace. Grace is a gift that cannot be earned. Over in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, hear what the Bible says. It says, the wages of sin is death, but here it is again. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so God offers you, right, this amazing gift of grace that is eternal life. And this eternal life is wrapped all the way up in Jesus Christ. And so when you receive Jesus Christ, you receive God's gift of eternal life. It's amazing. John can't quit talking about Jesus. I'll never forget, I'm not even making this up. Several years ago, there was a, there was a woman that came, and, and at first I thought somebody was punking me. I thought, I thought they were doing like a secret camera just to mess with me. Because a woman came up, and here's what she said. She said, we're not going to go to church here any longer. And I expected her to say, because we don't like you, or the music's too loud. Or I'll have folks from time to time that'll say this, we're leaving Highland Park because she's become too big. When I, don't get mad at me, i got nothing to do with that. That'd be the very one that brings the harvest. Take it up with him. I don't know, what do you do? Do you put, you put out there on the door, we've reached our capacity, no one else allowed. So if you're going to leave, at least do this, say, I don't like the way you look, I don't like your voice, I don't, just do something like that. It'll be received much better than you saying, the church is too big. I always want to say, so you're going to go somewhere where y'all going to keep that down. But here's what this lady said. Yeah, we're going to go somewhere else because all you want to do is talk about Jesus. I'm not making this up. And I'm like, are you serious? Okay, all right, yeah, I'll take that. That's a compliment. That's a compliment. We remove Jesus, guys. We've got nothing to hold to. We remove Jesus. We have no foundation. We remove Jesus. Then we can do things like we did on Friday night. But now we're no different than some kind of culture that is uh, involved with all these social clubs. We've got nothing to offer. If we remove Jesus, it's all in vain. If we remove Jesus, I can't stand up here and say, come to one that will receive you just as you are. He knows all about you, and he loves you too much to leave you the way you are he'll save you and change you and make you a new creature in him we'll proudly preach of jesus we'll proudly sing of jesus when they make us take baptist off the sign we should say highland park jesus church i grew up in a small little church Rural West Tennessee. Our high attendance Sunday would be a hundred. And I remember like, oh my goodness, we had a hundred today at church. Hundred. When I surrendered to preach as a young man, many of you know my dad's a pastor, and this morning he's pastoring a church. If they had 40 or 50, they've had a great Sunday. But my dad didn't surrender to preach until after I'd been preaching. For almost 10, 15 years, I had the opportunity to preach his ordination service. But the little church I grew up in, there was a pastor there. He didn't have a college degree. He barely finished high school. Yet when I went in, I said, I think God's calling me to preach. He said, well, I don't know a lot to tell you. He said, but I'll tell you the two things I know. And they, they weren't in this order. Actually, this was number two, but I share it with you first. Make sure you wash your hands twice when you walk out from that service. Because you never know what you're touching when you shake those hands. <laughs> to this day, I still do. I go in my study, I wash them once, and I go ahead and wash them twice. 
But here's what he said to me that I still remember and I still pattern everything I do after it. I didn't learn this in Bible college. I didn't learn it through all the degrees and seminary and all that. Here's what he said. I don't care where you are in the Bible. You make a beeline to the cross in Jesus as quick as you can. Because if you don't give them Jesus, you're giving them nothing. That's John. That's John. John's like, man, let me tell you, it's all about Jesus. He has revealed God's glory. He has revealed God's grace. And then listen, listen to what he says there in verse 16. It says that we have received grace upon grace. Grace for grace. Here's the idea that it carries with it. And undoubtedly it excites me a whole lot more than it excites some of you. But here's what it carries with it. It's not that God said, okay, I will give you grace. But then this is all the grace you're getting. It carries with it the idea, I'm going to pour out grace, and then I'm going to pour out grace, and then I'm going to pour out grace, and I'm going to give you more grace and more grace, and grace upon grace upon grace. I'll give you grace in the name of Jesus Christ, and guess what? And then I'll pour out more grace in the name of Jesus Christ, and then I'll pour out more grace in the name of Jesus Christ. And can I tell you the reason why that excites me? I'm a person that requires a lot of grace. Man, I'm so thankful that God doesn't say, okay, listen, I had no idea just how bad some of you would be. Yeah, 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 yeah. Listen, man, I I don't have enough grace to give you. The grace meter's come and gone. But he doesn't say that. The very phrase that he uses there, again, is John is saying, do you want to see God's glory? It's in Jesus. Do you want to see God's grace? It's in Jesus. The very phrase, he'll pour it out. It's limitless. Now, there's a lot of things that are limitless in life that are not good. Taxes, they're limitless. They're not good. The interest rate, whew. Inflation, limitless, not good. But there are some good things. I'll never forget when we were building our house that we got into four months before the hurricane. And then we kind of got to build it again. And, and I know I'm preaching to the choir, okay, so please hear me. We were, we, were, we were much better shaped than a lot of folks, okay. But when we built our house, and Terry, one of our deacons here at the church, built our house I'll never forget, he said, he said I just assume that you're going to want this uh, tankless water heater. And I'm like, well, I've never had a tankless water heater. Tell me about it. And he goes, well, you know, a water heater has a big tank, and it fills up with water, and then it heats that water. And then when you run out of that water, you've got to wait on more water to be heated again. That's the reason why you run out of hot water. Okay, I know some of you are like, I can't believe you're explaining this. I'm just explaining it to lay people who don't understand it like me. And he, you know, at the time, our, both of our daughters were teenagers. Our son was, he was at that age to where he could take a 30-second shower. To the point where you're like, I don't believe you've really taken a shower. And now he's a teenager and he's increased his time in the shower. But what would happen is, you know, everybody would take their showers and there would be times that I would get into the shower and, and all of a sudden the water would be hot and it would hit me and I'm like, yes, what a glorious day. Hot shower to start the day. And then all of a sudden, about the time you get soaked up real good, boom, cold water. That'll make a preacher cuss. <laughs> Not me, I'm just saying somebody else. From time to time throughout our marriage, I've tried to cuss, and Jennifer always laughs. You're not even using it in the right way. (laughs) I'm like, please tell me how to use it correctly. And so as I'm talking with him, he's like, you know, I I just do this on all the houses I'm building right now. This tankless water heater so you can run the dishwasher. You can run the, you know, you can be running the washing machine. Everybody can be taking a shower and all the different showers, and the water will still be hot. And I thought after we'd lived there for a little while, let's test it. Dishwasher running, washing machine running. One kid was in one bathroom, one kid was in another bathroom. I went in there and I turned it as hot as I could get it. And I went in there and I'm like, I'm not soaping up, I'm not falling for this one. 
and it was still hot. I'm like, I think I will soap up. And it was still hot. And I'm like, I've got to back off a little bit. It's too hot. And I'm like, I think I'm just going to hang out in here for a little while. And it never got cold. Now, I'm not getting a percentage of cuts for tankless water heaters, but I'm telling you, if you want to have a glorious life, and as Joel says, live your best life now, get a tankless water heater. It's limitless. That's the very phrase that Paul, or Paul, listen to me, that John is using right here when it comes to God's grace. It's like waves of the sea, and it just keeps touching us, and it is grace upon grace upon grace. I have a pastor friend in Tennessee that told this story several years ago. He said there was a, a lady in her late 80s that was a member of his church, and even though her mind was still sharp, her body started failing her, and they put her in a nursing home. He said he was there, he was visiting with her one day, and he asked the question, he said, listen, is there anything in your life that you really wish you'd been able to do? And she said, I've never been to the ocean. I'd love to see the ocean. She said, I've lived in Tennessee my whole life. And so the pastor said that he went and he talked to one of his deacons, and they decided they were going to break her out of the nursing home. And so they did. They put her in a wheelchair, and they got a van, and they... They drove the 10 hours from Tennessee, and they came down around Pensacola, and he said, we, we took her wheelchair, and we wheeled it up right there on one of the sand dunes, and he said it was a beautiful spring day, and the sky was blue, and the water was crystal blue, and he said, honestly, you couldn't even tell where the water stopped and the sky started. He said it was that blue, and he said, I was there as... As she smiled and she looked at me and he said, tears started running down her wrinkled cheeks. And she turned to her pastor and here's what she said. It's so good to find something that there's enough of. It's so good to find something that there is enough of. Can I just say, that's the way I feel when I think about God's grace. It's so wonderful to find something that there is enough of. And for us and for all the other sinners in the world, there is more than enough grace. There's more than enough mercy. Just when you think that God may say you've exhausted it all, he says, nope, this grace well doesn't run dry. I'll continue to send out more and more mercy. And hear me, guys, it's not based upon who you and I are. It's based upon who he is. Hmm. And so he declares God's glory, he declares God's grace, and then third, he declares God's goodness. We, we, we may get out on time. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Now stop and think about this. What is the ultimate sin of humanity? Trying to be God. That's what got Adam and Eve in all kinds of trouble. You remember the serpent? The serpent came to them, and the serpent's like, hey, I know God's told you not to eat from that tree over there, but here's the reason why, reason why he doesn't want you to eat from that tree, because he knows the moment that you eat from that tree, you're going to be just like him. You're going to be God. And so if the ultimate expression of evil is when man tries to be God, I'd submit to you that the ultimate expression of love and goodness is when God chooses to come down and become a man. That Jesus revealed the very nature of God to us. That Jesus shows us that there is a loving, good God. That the Bible says that Jesus went about doing good. Why? Because that's the very nature of God. That there was someone one day who came along and they asked a question to Jesus and they said, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And before Jesus answered the question, in true Jesus fashion, he asked a question. And Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's no one good except God. And then Jesus answered the question. And notice this, Jesus did not say, don't call me good. Matter of fact, Jesus said this, you're right in calling me good. Because only God's good. And I am 
God. I bring that up because I want to remind you again that my salvation and your salvation, it does not depend upon our goodness, but it depends upon God's goodness. And God has declared through Jesus Christ that he is good to sinners. If you were to go out and you were to ask the average person on the street, and I would even say probably in the parking lots of a lot of churches, if you were to ask them this question, how do you get to heaven? Most folks are going to answer it, and they're going to talk about being good and doing good. The fact that you have a better life, or the fact that you do better things, or the fact that you might be a nicer person than most, that while it may make you a better neighbor, it doesn't make you fit for heaven. That can only happen by grace. Suppose with me today that there were three men who said, you know what, here's what we're going to do. We've really been working hard. We've been training. We're such great swimmers. We're going to swim across the Gulf of Mexico to Cancun. Yeah, we're going to go right out here to Panama City Beach, and we're going to get in the water, and we're going to make that roughly five, six hundred miles across water, swimming, and we're going to walk up on the shore of Cancun. First of all, we would respond like the lady who just laughed out loud. And we would say, you're crazy. There's nobody. And while it's true, there will probably be one of them that will be able to swim further than the other two. The fate of all three is the same, death. And I bring that up because you may be better than your neighbor, you may not cuss your kids, you may not kick your dog, you may not throw beer cans over the back of your fence, you know, you may not even let your grass grow higher than the HOA approved level. But apart from Christ, you'll go to hell just like them. And so God's too high, God's too holy for us even on our best days. Or our best weeks, or maybe if you're here and you're like, this year's been a lot better than last year. Last year, I was really, really bad, and this year, I've just only been a little bit of bad. Well, good, good job, but that doesn't make you acceptable to Him. Our salvation, John's making the point, our salvation is based on God's goodness, based on God's grace. Now stop and think about these, God's glory, God's grace, God's goodness. There's one time in the Old Testament where we see all three of these come into play. Exodus chapter 33. Moses is on top of Mount Sinai. The Bible says that he is a friend of God. That he and God have grown so close in their relationship. And Moses is like, hey Lord, do you know what I would really like to have happen? Now let me just stop and say this. I always find great humor in someone saying, hey Lord, do you know? Can I cut to the chase? Yes, he does. God, you know what I would really like to see happen? I would like to see your face. We're such good friends. Show me your face. And God's like, well, we got a problem here. Nobody, nobody can see my face and live. Again, that Shekinah glory that we talked about there, the very presence of God, that's the reason why I find it humorous when so many folks sit there and say to me, well, when I get to heaven, I'm going to go up to God, and I'm going to say, God, why this happened, and God, why that happened? And I'm like, okay, okay, okay. And here's what I'm thinking in my head. You're going to fall down like a dead person in the presence of his glory. <laughs> and so Moses is like, can I see your face? And God's like, all right, here's the deal. Here's what I'll do. I'll hide you in the cleft of a rock, and a hewn out section of a mountain and I'll pass by you and I'll just let I'll just let that that robe of my glory right the that's following behind me I'll let you just kind of see it out of the peripheral vision because that way it won't kill you and the Bible says that it happened and from that day forward everybody's like Moses you got to start using sunscreen man this is stay out of the sun a little bit your face is so burnt Well, I want you to listen to what God said to him in Exodus 33, verse 19 and 20. We're almost done. Hang with us. He said, I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you, and I will proclaim the name the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I will be gracious. I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Oh, my goodness. But he added, you can't see my face. For humans cannot see me and live. 
Here's what God has just said. You want to know when you can see my, good, my glory? You see my glory when you see my goodness. And my goodness is not based upon your goodness. My goodness is based upon my gracious nature to show compassion to whomever I want to show compassion to. So God's sitting there and God's saying this to you and I today. I know you're working hard to clean yourself up. I know you're going through that 12-step thing. I know you're better today than you were last week. But the point that you're trying to achieve cannot be achieved through you. It can only come through me. Turn to me. And God's so glorious that no person can look on his face and live. And that's the reason why he sent Jesus. That when people looked at the deity of God veiled in human flesh... They could see God and they wouldn't die. Now, across the beautiful waters of Maui, and I've never been there. Some of you guys have, and still praying for somebody to sow that into my ministry. No, no I'm, no, I'm kind of kidding about that. Um, across the beautiful waters of Maui is the island of Molokai. Molokai, some of you may have been there today, it's a tropical paradise. But in the 1800s, it had a nickname, and here's what it was, Hell Island. In the 1860s, there was an outbreak of leprosy. Leprosy is when the skin starts falling off the body. Ultimately, the entire body shuts down and they die. Someone who has leprosy, they are known as a leper. And so there was an outbreak of leprosy that became an epidemic. The Hawaiian government rounded up every infected person and they were taken to Molokai. Well, they didn't have a harbor there. They didn't have a pier there. And so what would happen is they would get close to the shore and they would throw them overboard the ship. Many didn't even make it to the shore. But those who did were able to live. Supply ships occasionally brought crates that were thrown overboard. And if the current was just right, the supplies would make it to the shore. The lepers huddled together in crude shacks that they built. Hundreds of them were condemned to die with no hope. And then seven years later, after the colony began, there was a preacher from Belgium. He arrived to minister to the lepers. His friends told him, you're crazy to go to Hell Island. But he heard the call of God, and he said he must obey. He was not only a preacher, but he had some carpentry skills and also some medical skills. So he helped the leopards build houses and build a church and build a clinic. And he even helped them build coffins for the dead. He transformed the community from one of filth and crime into a community of love, respect, and laughter. Eventually, every single resident of the colony converted to Jesus Christ underneath his preaching. After a few years, he himself contracted leprosy. The next Sunday, he stood before his congregation, as I am doing before you today, and here's what he said. We lepers must trust Christ. When the pastor arrived, he was a young, hearty, healthy, 33-year-old man. He had no signs of poor health. And they said that when he died at the age of 49... He looked much older than his years. What would compel a man to leave the safety and the health of his homeland to travel many miles to Hell Island? To what we would say is a place of hopelessness. What would cause a man of perfect health to live among those who were full of disease and even eventually contract their disease? I'm not even asking those questions now in regard to the pastor. I'm asking those questions now in regard to Jesus. That John has just told us that Jesus left the safety and he left the holiness of heaven to come to this moral garbage dump of sin and disease. And guys, even though Jesus was totally sinless, he took upon himself our sin. Our vile shame. 
You may be here this morning or you may be watching outside of this room and you may think, I thank God that I've never suffered from leprosy on Molokai, but each and every one of us are infected with a deadly disease and it's the disease of sin. And so guys, Jesus... He made the trek. He traveled from the safety and the holiness of heaven to come down again to this moral garbage dump called earth. Why? To show us God's love. And in the process of showing us God's love, this man who knew no sin, the Bible says, became just that, sin for us, so that we might become like him, clean before God. And that is what happened on the cross of Jesus Christ. Remember I told you I grew up in a small, small little church. We would would sing our songs out of the hymn book. I know some of you think singing out of the hymn book makes you closer to God. Oh, it's going to be funny when you get to heaven and there are no hymn books. Anyway, you're like, do you know? (laughs) I don't. (laughs) I used to love it. There's one song that we would sing usually a couple times a month. It was hymn 138 in the old Baptist hymn book at Calvary. Here's why I like it, because it was done faster than most of the other songs. Now, it was still too slow. And that's the reason why if you're like, I don't like that fast, loud music we do here. Don't go to these guys on the stage. That's all coming from me. I just can't see I just can't see the worship service in heaven as Shh, let's do it really slow. But if we get there and I'm wrong, you won't care. Our arm waver would say, turn to him 138. We'll do the first, second, and the last. You old timers know what I'm talking about. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Help me out if you know the chorus. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. And he'll give that same thing to you. Will you trust Jesus today? Would you bow your heads with me? With your heads bowed, your eyes closed, you're here today and you say, you know what? I realize I'm never going to live a life good enough to have all my sin forgiven. That the only hope I have is Jesus. And I'm ready to trust Him as my Lord. The Bible says this, that if you believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead and you call upon His name, you will be saved. If you're here today and you're ready to turn to Jesus, surrendering your life to Him, I want to invite you right now in this very moment to pray this prayer. Now please hear me, friend. You're not putting your faith in a prayer. A prayer never forgave one single sin. But this prayer is a way for you to put into words what faith is already doing in your heart. It helps you call upon the name of Jesus. I invite you right now in the quietness, the stillness of this moment in your heart to call upon Jesus. Would you pray this? Would you say, Dear Lord Jesus, I realize I'm a sinner. And Jesus, I'm never going to live a life that's good enough to forgive me of all my sin. So Jesus, I ask you to forgive me right now. I put my faith, my trust in you. Jesus, I do believe that you're God in the flesh. I do believe that you lived on this earth. I believe that you died on that cross, the cross of Calvary. Jesus, I also believe that you rose from the dead. And I believe that you're coming back again one day. And so, Jesus, I surrender my life's control to you. Would you pray that today? Is that the desire of your heart? Would you call upon him, Jesus, to the best I know how? 
I surrender my life to you. Now, friend, you've not put your faith in a prayer. You're not put your faith in a church. Oh, my goodness. You've not put your faith in a preacher. But instead, today, you've put your faith in the King of all kings, Jesus Christ. In just a moment, we're going to stand. There are going to be pastors all across this front. If today you called upon the name of Jesus, you prayed that prayer, you meant that with your heart, that was your desire, we're going to invite you to come. We don't want you to be ashamed of the decision that you made. We want to rejoice with you. We want to tell you now that you are saved, here's what to do next. Oh, not because you have to do anything else. No, Jesus is enough. But because you want to do it. You want to live a life to please Him. You want to be obedient to Him. There are others of you in this room that you know that Jesus is your Savior and Lord. You know that if today were to be your last day, heaven would be your home. Just like that precious little old lady that they wheeled up to the top of that sand dune over by Pensacola. When's the last time you looked upon the gulf of God's grace in your life? And you just said, thank you, Lord. Thank you that it never runs dry. Thank you that it's limitless. Thank you that you love me too much to leave me just the way I am. That maybe today you would come and you would humble yourself all across this front, this altar, area that we designated as a special place of prayer, that you'd come. And you just take the time to say, thank you for your grace, Lord. Grace upon grace upon grace. Oh, God, may you speak, may we listen. For those who prayed to receive you as Lord today for the first time in their life, our prayer is that today they would gloriously, unashamedly proclaim, I belong to Jesus. Roam across this room, speak to hearts. We will give you all praise and glory.